Well, I hope you won't be disappointed to find out I'm not actually preaching until tomorrow. This is a lecture. This is something different. I want to tell you about a man standing in front of a judge. The judge has just sentenced him to prison. And the man says this, bold but respectful. Sir, as to this matter, I am at a point with you. The sense is, we've come face to face and I cannot back down. For if I am out of prison today, I will preach the gospel again tomorrow by the help of God. These words were John Bunyan's parting shot to the judge who had just sentenced him to jail for preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. They even threatened him with death if he did not give up his ministry. During what became 12 years in jail, Bunyan's tongue worked through his pen. Of the several books which he wrote or worked on during his imprisonment, one especially has become a classic in the fullest sense of the word, and its title is The Pilgrim's Progress. Now the theme which I have for my participation in this conference, and I am delighted that I'm able to be here and to serve you in this way, is the theme of pilgrimage. So this afternoon, we'll draw some lessons from a pilgrim, and then, God willing, tomorrow and the following day, we'll turn more particularly to our Bibles to see some uh, lessons and some helps for us as pilgrims and pastors. So. I'm going to tell you a little bit about John Bunyan and then something about his book, The Pilgrim's Progress. Now, how many of you have read The Pilgrim's Progress? Excellent. I hope by the end of this, you're all going to go home and say, I will read it again. <laughs> Who has not read The Pilgrim's Progress? Okay, you're going to go home and say, I've got to read this book. Okay, that's the aim. So, John Bunyan. John Bunyan was born in November of the year 1628 in the county of Bedfordshire in England. His father was a brazier or a tinker. He did basic work on metal, usually things like mending pots and pans. John Bunyan was briefly sent to school where he learned to read and write, but soon he got out of school to follow his father's trade and by his own admission, he forgot a lot of what he'd learned while he was at school. From a young age, everybody used to talk about what an ungodly boy John Bunyan was. Mothers would threaten their children in the village where he lived that if they did not listen to mum, they would end up like John Bunyan. <laughs> but even then, he had terrifying dreams of God's punishment of sinners. While he was a young boy, a young man, his life was spared on at least one occasion when he almost drowned in a boating accident. Now in 1642, the English Civil War began. King Charles I, who was on the throne at the time, overstepped his authority. He had a parliament and they thought that the king should pay attention to the will of the people. But Charles was persuaded that he had what was called the divine right of kings and he did not need to listen to Parliament. They disagreed so strongly that war broke out and the royalists of King Charles clashed with the parliamentary army. John Bunyan's mother and sister died in 1644 and the same year, probably after his 16th birthday, John Bunyan became a soldier in the Parliamentary Army. Now again, his life was spared in God's grace. He was meant to be standing guard on the walls of a city one night that was under siege by the Royalist forces. But he swapped his post with another man who was shot and killed as he took his guard. Bunyan's regiment was disbanded in 1647 and he returned to a small village in Bedfordshire called Elstow. Shortly afterwards, he married. His wife, whose name we don't know, had a godly father. And Bunyan says that they were as poor as poor might be. 
but his wife brought two books with her as part of her entry into the marriage. One was called The Plain Man's Pathway to Heaven by Arthur Dent, and the other was called The Practice of Piety or The Practice of Holiness by Lewis Bailey. Now, reading these, and under some influence from his wife, Bunyan's conscience began to afflict him, and so he became an outwardly moral man. But he says he was not sensible of the danger and evil of sin. He didn't realise the sinfulness and the awfulness of sin. But that too soon began to change, and Bunyan spent several years deeply distressed and sometimes despairing on account of his felt sin and need of salvation. He used to go to an Anglican church and he used to enjoy ringing the bell, but he thought that God would be so angry with him that he could not ring the bell in case God made it fall out and land on his head. So he would go to the side and he'd let the others ring the bell. And then he thought God could send the tower down on him, so he moved to the door. But he was so scared, sooner or later he wasn't able to even do those things. So he felt that God was pursuing him. He came into contact with an independent church in Bedford, pastored by a godly man named John Gifford. And he found profitable instruction in his wrestlings with God and with his conscience. He struggled on in spiritual agony, though, for years not just days or months, but years, assaulted by all manner of questions, concerns, doubts, and temptations. Bunyan longed to be saved, but he was afraid that he was damned. Then one day he says, This sentence fell upon my soul. Thy righteousness is in heaven. I saw with the eyes of my soul Jesus Christ at God's right hand, there, I say, as my righteousness. I also saw, moreover, that it was not my good frame of heart that made my righteousness better, nor yet my bad frame that made my righteousness worse. For my righteousness was Jesus Christ himself, the same yesterday and today and forever. What Bunyan means there is, if I've had a good day, it doesn't mean that God is more pleased with me. And if I've had a bad day, God is less pleased with me. In terms of his justice as a judge, if my righteousness is the fixed righteousness of Jesus Christ, then I have nothing of which to be afraid. He says, Now did my chains fall off my legs indeed. I was loosed from my affliction and irons, my temptations also fled away. His soul had found peace after many long and painful struggles through the righteousness of Jesus Christ. He was soon afterward admitted to the membership of the Bedford Independent Church and invited to exercise his gifts as a preacher. I preached, he said, what I felt, what I smartingly did feel, what I deeply and painfully felt. Now, his preaching so earnest, so direct and so passionate, was very effective among the common people who heard him. But it was not generally considered acceptable for an untaught man to preach in the political and cultural climate. And it became even less so in 1660 when King Charles II came to the throne. So most of this was happening to Bunyan in the years between King Charles I coming off the throne and the reign of a man called Oliver Cromwell when there was relative freedom, but then the son of Charles I, Charles II, comes to the throne and he is as, at least as bad a man as his father ever was. Now Bunyan's first wife died in 1658 and he married a godly woman named Elizabeth in 1659. She was pregnant with his first child, as well as caring for his four children from his previous marriage when Bunyan came into open conflict with the authorities. During the rule of Oliver Cromwell, the kind of churches to which Bunyan was ministering enjoyed some freedom, but Charles II took all those freedoms away. 
And Bunyan was one of the first preachers outside of the National Anglican Church, which Charles was supporting. And at this time, you must understand that Charles' desire was really to return Anglicanism to a form very much like Roman Catholicism. So, Bunyan has nothing to do with that church anymore. He is outside of those congregations and a warrant for his arrest was issued in November 1660. So the Christians couldn't meet in public anymore. They'd go out into the fields and they would meet under trees, sometimes called gospel oaks, gospel oak trees. So Bunyan arrives to preach at one of these illegal gatherings of dissenting Christians. Some people were afraid of the persecution and they said we should cancel the meeting. Bunyan's response, our cause is good. We need not be ashamed of it. To preach God's word is so good a work that we shall be well rewarded even if we suffer for it. Before he had been preaching for long, the persecutors arrived. Bunyan was arrested and eventually committed to prison for three months charged with refusing to attend the services of the established Anglican Church and preaching to what were called unlawful assemblies or conventicles. He refused to conform and even though his poor wife pleaded with the authorities, not only did he go to prison for three months, but without further trial, those three months stretched to 12 years in jail. Opportunity was forced upon him and John Bunyan began to write. His spiritual autobiography, Grace Abounding to the Chief of Sinners, was one of the fruits of his time in prison and was the last one of his prison works to be published before his release in 1672. And that was the year in which Charles II issued what was called an indulgence, which was basically the king saying, look how kind I am, I'll let some of the prisoners out of jail. During his imprisonment though, Bunyan had been able to main contact, maintain contact with the church and had even been voted to be their pastor. That's how much they thought of him as a man of God. He might have been in prison, but they still wanted him as one of the pastors and preachers of the church. Using his freedom fully, he was so active, travelling, preaching and organising that he became known locally as Bishop Bunyan. The threat of further imprisonment was never far off though and he was back in jail for six months again in 1677. It was during this imprisonment that he probably put the finishing touches to the book which he probably wrote most of during his first time in jail, The Pilgrim's Progress. The first part of this book, and remember it's published in two parts and for reasons I will explain you need to read both parts. The first part was published in 1678, followed by other major works including The Life and Death of Mr. Badman, a book that I think at least rivals this, if not excels it, called The Holy War. So if you have read this, you can reread this first and then you must read The Holy War. And then a second part to The Pilgrim's Progress. Despite ongoing waves of persecution, Bunyan's popularity grew. His book, The Pilgrim's Progress, was a bestseller of the day. Thousands would gather to hear him preach. When he came to London, 1,200 people gathered at 7 o'clock on a winter workday to listen to him explain the Word of God. And brothers, if you think it's cold here at the moment, let me tell you that 7 o'clock on a winter workday in London would be horrible. Among his regular hearers, at such occasions was a man called John Owen who was perhaps the greatest Puritan theologian of them all. Now he moved in high circles and it's told, the story is told that King Charles II once asked John Owen, why do you go to hear that tinker chatter? And Owen said, may it please your majesty, could I possess the tinker's abilities for preaching I would willingly give up all my learning. In 1688, Bunyan travelled from Bedford to the town of Reading, which is to the west of London, where he was seeking to bring a father and a son who were fighting with each other back into a good relationship. The work was successful and Bunyan rode on towards London on his horse, despite a gathering storm. He arrived in London soaked through, 
and developed a fever, although he preached the next Lord's Day. His health then rapidly declined. By, fr by Friday the 31st of August in 1688, several friends had gathered around the dying man. After some gracious conversation, they asked if anything more could be done for him. Brothers, he replied, I desire nothing more than to be with Christ, which is far better. Stretching out his arms, he cried, Take me, for I come to thee. And so he crossed over the river to the celestial city. He was buried in a cemetery called Bunhill Fields, used by the dissenters. And the book that he carried with him to London was published shortly afterwards by his friends. And it is called The Acceptable Sacrifice, or The Excellency of a Broken Heart. Only a few months later would come the toppling of the king who was then on the throne, James II, which brought in what is called the Glorious Revolution of 1689. So Bunyan died about a year before the religious freedom that he had always been denied was granted to dissenters. Well, that was the life and the testimony of John Bunyan, very briefly. The best known of his works today is still The Pilgrim's Progress. It has been suggested with some uh, good evidence that after the Bible, this has been the most popular book ever written in the English language. So I want to look with you at some of the distinguishing features of this book that have made it so valuable for so many years as a guide to Christian faith and experience. Now, as we've seen, Bunyan probably wrote the bulk of the first part of the Pilgrim's Progress during his lengthy imprisonment. And when you know something about his life, you're able to see certain events and people and places reflected in his book. Now, the full title is typical of that day. Uh, it gives us an insight into its contents and purpose. We just call it the Pilgrim's Progress. This is what really it says. The Pilgrim's Progress from this world to that which is to come, delivered under the similitude, that's the likeness of a dream, wherein is discovered the manner of his setting out, his dangerous journey and safe arrival at the desired country. You can see why they shortened it to the Pilgrim's Progress. The second part of the book has an almost identical title, except that it sets forth the manner of the setting out of Christian's wife and children, their dangerous journey and self-safe arrival at the desired country. Now those titles tell you a great deal. The main motif or theme of the book is pilgrimage. The starting point is the city of destruction and the destination to which the faithful pilgrims travel is the celestial city. The book is what is called an allegory. And if you don't know what that is, and you look it up in a dictionary, it's an example of how effective Bunyan's book has been, that most dictionaries will say, see Pilgrim's Progress. It's how you explain what an allegory is. <laughs> it is an extended metaphor. It's a vivid comparison in which the characters, the events, and the locations represent or symbolize other things. Bunyan uses this device as a way to teach, employing a colorful and memorable style to fix the truth in his readers' minds and hearts. So, for example, the city of destruction, which will be burned with fire from heaven, he says, is this present world. And the celestial city to which the pilgrims travel is the eternal and heavenly kingdom of God's Son enjoyed by the saints after death. So let me give you a quick survey of the two parts. The first part traces the pilgrimage of a man called Christian. Now all Bunyan's characters have names. In fact, in one of his places called Vanity Fair, there is a judge called Lord Hategood. And you can imagine, perhaps, that this is Bunyan's idea of the man who sentenced him to prison for <laughs> preaching the gospel. So you make those connections. So, several of the people whom he encounters, or the locations through which Christian travels, are well known wherever the book has been read, and have entered the linguish, la English language, becoming accepted literary references. One of the first places to which Christian comes is called the Slough of Despond. You might call it the Swamp of Sorrow, 
where he is almost overcome by doubts and fears, very much like John Bunyan himself was, wanting to be saved, but afraid that he was lost. He's almost thrown off course, but the faithful man evangelist directs him to the wicket gate, which is a small gate that only people can go through, which he must pass to find the path to the celestial city. Well, he goes through and comes to the house of the interpreter who shows him many wondrous things. Let me just tell you one of the first wondrous things he shows him. It's a picture of a very grave or serious person hanging on the wall. It had its eyes lifted up to heaven, the best of books in his hand, the law of truth written upon his lips, the world behind its back. It stood as if it pleaded with men, and a crown of gold did hang over its head. The man whose picture this is is one of a thousand. He can bring forth children, labour in birth with children, and nurse them himself when they are born. And because you see him with his eyes lifted up to heaven, the best of books in his hand, and the law of truth written on his lips, it is to show you that his work is to know and to explain dark things to sinners. Even as you also see him stand as if he pleaded with men. And because you see him with the world cast behind him and a crown hanging over his head, that is to show you that slighting or turning his back on and despising the things that are present for the love that he has to his master's service, he is sure in the world that comes next to have glory for his reward. I have showed you this picture first, said the interpreter, because the man whose picture this is, is the only man whom the Lord of the place where you are going has authorised to be your guide. Brothers, that's your description, if you're a pastor. Would anybody recognise you or me in that language? Christian leaves the house of the interpreter and goes up a hill with the cross upon it where he loses the burden of sin that he's been carrying on his back. He goes up another hill called Difficulty and goes between two chained lions to a place where he can rest and gets armour and weapons for his onward journey. That arms and armour are immediately put to the test in a long and painful battle with Apollyon, the devil, where Christian wins through, though badly wounded, in the face of much distress. Then he meets a fellow pilgrim called Faithful and they go to a place called Vanity Fair, or the fair of emptiness, uh, where both of them are imprisoned by Judge Hategood and Faithful is martyred. Christian escapes and he goes on from Vanity Fair with a new friend called Hopeful who has become a pilgrim because of the way that Christian and Faithful suffered and spoke. The two then escape the snares of the hill Luca, or the mountain of money, they are captured by giant despair because Christian walks out of the path and they're held for a time in Doubting Castle. But they escape from Doubting Castle using a key called Promise. Now as you hear these things, I hope if you haven't read this, you begin to think, this man is clever. How do you get out of doubts? Well, you use the promises of God. Well, so someone who's doubting gets trapped by despair, but if you tell them to use the promises, they can escape. These are the sorts of pictures that Bunyan uses to explain what the Christian life is like. So they go on to the delectable mountains, the delightful mountains, and they meet four shepherds, another picture of pastors. They're called knowledge, experience, watchful, and sincere. And they're able to see through a telescope the celestial city in the distance which stirs up their hearts for the journey. They meet men called ignorance and atheist and they come to a place called the enchanted ground where they almost fall asleep but to stop themselves becoming dozy they speak of the things of the kingdom of God and so they come through to the land of Beulah where they at last find a place of rest. One last obstacle awaits them, a river, death. You cannot get to the celestial city except through the river. And the depth of that river depends on the degree of faith in the one who passes through. Now Hopeful, remember the name, when Hopeful goes through, it's barely up around his knees. But when Christian goes through, he begins to be overwhelmed with fears and the waters nearly go over his head. Hopeful 
who's going through with him tells him to lift up his head and to look at what lies before him. And with those encouragements, Christian gets a view of Jesus Christ that takes him away from his fears and means he goes through the river safely. And so they come to the celestial city and are welcomed into glory. Now in the second part of the pilgrim's progress, there is a band or group of pilgrims following the same route. The core comprises Christian's wife, Christiana, who goes onto the pilgrim way after her husband crosses the river. So you get the sense that perhaps this is a woman whose husband became a believer. She died. Now she says, well, I want to go to the place that he has gone. Her sons go with her and she has a young friend called Mercy. So by adopting this method in the second part, Bunyan deals with several matters that he couldn't deal with in the first part. He says, what Christian left locked up and went his way, sweet Christiana opens with her key. These new pilgrims also face a painful struggle before entering through the narrow gate, after which they spend time in interpreter's house. Now he sends one of his servants with them, a faithful man called Greatheart, who guides them and guards them on their journey. As they travel, Greatheart often talks about the journey of Christian before them, and he uses that to teach them about what they will do on their way. He also fights for the pilgrims, killing two other giants called Maul and Slaygood. He also, with Christian, Christiana's sons and another pilgrim called Honest, kills giant Despair and his wife, and they pull down Doubting Castle. Other pilgrims join them as they travel, so you get a big group, and they face battles and perils that Christian did not, although they're passing through the same territory. There's even a marriage between Christiana's son, Matthew, and that young friend, Mercy. And eventually, this big pilgrim band comes to Beulah, where they await their summons across the river, during which time several of them give one another counsel, encouragement, and instruction before they go across one by one. So in the course of these two parts of the one book, we see men and women of various characters and dispositions fleeing the city of destruction and arriving at the celestial city at the end of their pilgrimage. Now, the genius of this structure is to give Bunyan broad scope to deal with the wide variety of Christian experience, focusing both on the individual and the, the community aspects of Christian living. Now, I've just given you outlines so you get an idea, especially if you haven't read the book, of, of what is in there. And especially if you are a young pastor or preacher and you want people to say to you not to be proud but so that you, you can serve them, how did someone so young get to be so wise? You read Pilgrim's Progress and it gives you an insight into this Christian experience that you yourself may not have and it gives you a head start on the kind of things that Christians go through on their pilgrimage. So, there is, I, I, I'd love to talk to you about some of the other characters that you could encounter in this book, but there are pilgrims and there are enemies who help us to illustrate the encouragements and the dangers and the temptations and the errors and the helps that exist along the way to the celestial city. But what I want to do now, and it's, it's in your outline, is to show you some of the particular qualities of the book that should encourage you to read it and which demonstrate how helpful it can be to us as pilgrims and to us as great hearts, if that's what we wish to be. First of all, in reading The Pilgrim's Progress, you should note its earnest biblicism. Its earnest biblicism. By that I mean it's a book that is full of the best of books, the Bible. Now Bunyan's knowledge and understanding of the Bible comes, becomes immediately clear in at least three ways. First of all, there is direct quotation from the Bible. Time after time, one or another of the pilgrims utters, receives, offers, or dwells upon the scripture as the expression of their own desires or convictions or as a source of instruction and comfort. 
We've already heard today the importance of uh, speaking and preaching the Word of God. These pilgrims are always speaking and preaching to one another the Word of God. The first thing that you find the pilgrim doing in the first part of the book is reading his Bible. And the first plain expression of his conviction of sin and his need of salvation is the very familiar cry, what must I do to be saved? Afterwards, there are hundreds of direct quotes from the Word of God, all of them appropriate to the particular needs and circumstances of the pilgrim. Now, in addition to direct quotations, the second way you see the Bible, if you are familiar with the Bible yourself, you will quickly identify and enjoy the scriptural flavour of the whole book. Now, Charles Spurgeon, the great Victorian preacher, said that Bunyan's book was the Bible in another shape. He suggested that Bunyan had read his Bible till his whole being was saturated or soaked with scripture. So that when we read Pilgrim's Progress, this is Spurgeon again, we feel and say, why, this man is a living Bible. Prick him anywhere and you will find that his blood is bibline. The very essence of the Bible flows from him. Again, is that the way people would talk about you? You cut that man and he bleeds Bible. It's just in him. It just comes out of him so readily. Spurgeon again. He cannot speak without quoting a text. For his soul is full of the Word of God. How much more useful would we be as ministers of the Word if we could not speak without quoting a text? Even when Bunyan is not using Bible words directly, giving chapter and verse, he seems unable to write without Bible words and phrases just flowing off his pen. Neither should we forget the third element, Bunyan's doctrinal insights. It's Bible truth that he's dealing with. Throughout the two parts, the various characters engage in conversations with friends, and they're usually talking about Christian truth and experience, or they're warning each other about dangers on the way, and with enemies. And there are several debates, there are accusations, or they, they answer errors. What is immediately evident, again, is Bunyan's practical grasp of the living truth. The Bible for Bunyan and the Bible for us is not a dead book, but the believer's guide in faith and life. Now, Bunyan was a warm-hearted, committed, thoroughly and truly evangelical Calvinist. Now, I have to say that carefully because I, there is an argument to be made that Bunyan is more of a Lutheran with regard to certain things than he was a Calvinist. Bunyan actually said uh, about uh, Luther's commentary on Galatians, I do prefer this book of Mr. Luther upon the Galatians, accepting the Holy Bible, before all the books that ever I have seen, as most fit for a wounded conscience. So Bunyan's doctrine of salvation, Bunyan's doctrine of justification by faith, comes almost directly from Luther. And that means certain things about the development of his theology that I won't go into now. But as Spurgeon says, Calvinism is simply a nickname for the truth of the Bible. And so we see in Pilgrim's Progress a sovereign and merciful God saving sinners by grace through faith in Jesus Christ. It is a book of the Reformation. Justification by faith in Christ the Redeemer lies at the heart of Bunyan's story. So the defining metaphor of Bunyan's book is biblical. The broad sweep and the careful details are all biblical. The language is biblical. The teachings, whether they are explicit or implicit, whether they are clearly stated or woven in, are all grounded in the Word of God. And the whole of it is delivered with the passionate earnestness of a man whose own soul depends on the truths that he wants others to hear and to heed. So remember what he said, I preached what I felt, what I smartingly did feel. What might that have sounded like? Read his books and you'll hear in his books the voice of the preacher. The second thing that Bunyan gives us is a realistic picture of decided and vigorous Christianity. Bunyan lived in an age and in a time and a place 
in which genuine Christianity could never be a game or a hobby. It was for him a matter of life or death, literally. Now, these issues are not cultural ones. They're not just to do with time and space. They are spiritual and eternal. And at the centre of everything is the question that Bunyan himself once had to face. Will you leave your sins and go to heaven, or have your sins and go to hell? Christian comes to the same point, Christian the pilgrim. He tells evangelist, I am not willing to die, but I am not able to face the judgment. However, having been guided to the path to the celestial city by evangelist, the pilgrim then holds to it through many trials and dangers, kept on the way through the grace of God until he reaches the end. Now, not everybody experiences or needs to experience the depths of woe, sorrow, or the precise conflicts that are pictured in Pilgrim's Progress, the realities of spiritual conflict that underpin the story. By that I mean, brothers, don't read that book and then say that unless you've had the same agony of soul as the Pilgrim, you're not really a Christian. Okay, not everybody goes through precisely the same experience in terms of its depth, although everybody must be saved in the same way. What you've actually got here is an honest treatment of what it means to be a real Christian and to enter into a life of wholehearted obedience to Jesus Christ, a life which necessarily involves hard work, much striving and fierce fighting against errors and dangers. The pilgrim's progress is Christian life as it really is, a life of earnest faith, sacrificial love and determined obedience to the Lord Christ to the very end. It is not Christian life the way most of us, if we were honest, would like it to be and many people think it might be an easy and comfortable ride to heaven. And so Bunyan's book is profoundly instructive. We must, through many tribulations, enter the kingdom of God. But it's also deeply encouraging because it reminds us that the pilgrim makes progress. Through the pages of both parts, you can trace the development of godly character as the, the different characters advance in their understanding, in their strength, and in their ability to keep going on the pilgrimage. There are painful lessons that they learn. Sometimes they make bad mistakes. But there is also an evident growth in godliness. And new challenges are met with greater firmness and ability than before. So you see this, for example, in the development of Christian and Christiana's sons in the second part. Over the course of the book, they all grow up and become godly young men. You also see it in the way that Christian, as an individual, grows as a mature child of God. And when we talk about progress, we must not forget that Christian and every other true pilgrim in the story reaches the celestial city. They all cross the river into the glorious presence of the king. The third thing is that Bunyan gives us a picture of Christian individuality, companionship and community. The first part of the book focuses on the journey of one man, really, Christian. We keep company with him on his way and we learn from his walk as an individual through the world. But we're not the only ones who keep him company. His most obvious fellow travellers are Faithful, the one who dies in the town of Vanity, and Hopeful. Now, Christian, the individual, Christian with his believing friends, and in the second part, Christian, uh, not Christian, sorry, Christiana and her family and Mercy and others under the care of Greatheart, a growing band of pilgrims making their way to the celestial city. So again, Bunyan's brilliance and his grasp of his Bible enables him to weave together the individual and the social and the corporate or church aspects of Christian living. 
Everybody individually needs to make their way to the celestial city. But we don't make our way in isolation. Christian depends heavily on his friends at key moments and they depend on him in their moments of concern and weakness. Sometimes the friends trip one another up. If you've been a Christian for very long, you've probably been in a situation where another Christian gave you bad advice so you gave them bad advice. You were trying to help but it didn't work out. Well, it's Christian who tells Hopeful, come on, let's go this way, I'm sure it's a shortcut, and ends them up in Doubting Castle with giant despair. More often, though, they keep one another out of trouble. They help and encourage each other. The value of Christian companionship and the beauty of true friendship are everywhere clear. The second part introduces Greatheart one of the most powerful and clear portraits of a true pastor in Christian literature. And the pilgrims under his care prosper because he is a loving guide and guardian. And again, brothers, if you want to know what a pastor looks like, read about Mr. Greatheart and study his care. The family, as well as the community elements of Christian living, are also there. Uh, Christian, Christiana, and Christiana's sons. Christianity then, remember, is not a religion of isolation. We must, each one of us, go to heaven, but we do not go alone. It's a religion of fellowship with the triune God and with others who belong to the same God. So the Christian, as it were, on his own before God and in scriptural companionship with other believers, with friends, with believing family members, true churches under the loving guidance of faithful pastors. They are all there in Bunyan's book. So, that's a very brief introduction and a very brief overview. I hope if you've read it before, you're now saying, hmm, maybe I should read this again. I'd like to see some more of these things. And if you've never read it, I hope you're saying, how have I missed this book for so many years? Well, I'm going to close with four very brief counsels about how you can best use the Pilgrim's Progress on your own journey from this world to the next. First of all, brothers, you should read it humbly. Read it humbly. The Lord God brought his servant John Bunyan through deep waters to teach him these truths. He earned by painful experience the the, the honour of writing this book for us. He lived and he died resting in the truths that were won at such great cost. In an age of spiritual giants and fierce battles for the truth, John Bunyan was highly esteemed and respected. How many other people do you think John Owen would have said of them? I would give up all my learning if I could just preach like him. Bunyan knew his Bible thoroughly. I don't know if you ever have Bible study competitions or things like that. I I don't like particularly the idea of that, but uh, I think if Bunyan was in it, he'd win it. He was loved as a faithful pastor and a sure counsellor and guide. Now a man in that kind of time, under those kind of circumstances, with that kind of reputation, you and I ought to read him carefully and expect to learn a lot from him. So read the book humbly. Then read it attentively. Bunyan wrote it not merely to give enjoyment. It's not just a story book. And it's not a children's book either. There are some good versions for children, but I get very frustrated when people talk about it as if it's just a book for children. It's also not just a nice work of art. It is usually studied today as a a, a literary phenomenon. Uh, And it's considered to be, for those of you who may be interested in this, it's considered to be the first example of the kind of self-aware literature that was beginning to develop, the first real work of fiction, uh, the first book that has a, a motif of travel in it that leads to the development of what we now call the modern novel. 
Well, some of that may be true, but it's not what Bunyan's about, and it's not why he wrote the book. And I can tell you from experience that you never want to argue that too plainly in a university environment. You'll get a very low mark from your professors. Uh, what I actually said was, if you're not a Christian, you can't understand John Bunyan. Um, my professor, well, my, my tutor was being schooled by one of the world experts in John Bunyan at the time, who was not a Christian man. And to tell the student that the master didn't understand John Bunyan was apparently not a wise thing to do. So I was young and even more foolish than I am now. <laughs> but read it then attentively, not as a storybook, not as a literary example, not as a children's book. Bunyan is writing as a pastor and as a Christian. He wants to communicate the truth to us in an engaging an attractive and a memorable fashion. It was written to teach, and so you should read it to learn about the Christian life which you and others are called to live. It's not then a storybook, but a life book. It deals with eternal realities about which we desperately need to learn if we are to live our lives to the glory of the living God. Then we should read it prayerfully. There are deep truths to be learned and the book is worthy of careful and prayerful thought. While it does teach the truth simply, there are some parts that are not so easy to understand and some of its lessons can be upsetting when we first encounter them. You should never read it instead of your Bible, but read it side by side with your Bible so that you can see what Spurgeon said. If, to whatever extent that's true, it's the Bible in another shape. You cross-check, you cross-reference. Yes, I can see this in the Word of God. I understand what he's talking about. See the truth which Bunyan wrote and see how he applies it to, to our lives. If we are not too proud to learn, but read prayerfully, then we will learn much. And then we should read it repeatedly. Charles Spurgeon, anybody know this? How many times has Charles Spurgeon said to have read this book? Yeah, over a hundred times. And if Spurgeon can read it over a hundred times and get something new out of it on each occasion, brothers, I'm not suggesting any of us will necessarily get that high, but we can read it over and over, can we not? And learn something from it. It remains fresh because it is so intensely scriptural. It will go on instructing you. If you've read it once already, I can almost guarantee that you will read it again and you will say, how did I miss that the first time? How did I not see that there? Well, the answer is you have grown. You have moved on. And so you see more of the pilgrim's experience in your life and you can learn more from the book. As Christian learned godliness as he travelled, so will you. As your own pilgrimage advances, Bunyan keeps on being your pastor. He constantly teaches us things that are newly applicable to the trials which you face now, providing encouragement, instruction, exhortation and counsel as we make our own way from the city of destruction to the celestial city by the same well-worn path of faith in Christ and obedience to God that has been travelled by so many pilgrims before us. Amen. Amen.